Well, hello, 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 and welcome to today's webinar with Cunity and Booksy on building a profit improvement plan. My name is Julia Yab, and I am here on behalf of Booksy, and I am here with the amazing Tom Kuhn, and I'm going to let him introduce himself. He's going to be leading us in today's webinar and teaching us all about not just the importance of building a profit improvement plan, but some of the steps to actually do so and have one and really be successful in your craft, which is what we're all about for all of you. So Tom, take it away. Well, thank you, Julia. I appreciate uh, uh, being part of this webinar and Booksy. Booksy does an amazing job and have such great resources and it's wonderful to be able to collaborate uh, with this. And so, yeah, building a profit improvement plan and um, the whole money aspect of the business. I'm going to start by uh, sharing my screen and uh, doing a presentation for all of you. Uh, so if you'll give me just a moment here to get myself set up. Uh, and uh, Julie, you can confirm we can see my screen? Yes, we can indeed see your screen. And while I am talking it again, I will just let everyone know who's in this webinar. We'll remind you along the way. On your screen, you should see options for chat. And if you have any questions, any comments, any burning things that you want to know from Tom along the way, go ahead and drop them in that chat. And I'll make sure that he gets the message while he's educating all of us. So here we go. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So money isn't the most important thing in life but it is like oxygen on the gotta have it scale you know i have said that phrase so many different times because it's so true that money is vital and it's a key currency that we have in life along with your attention and time and uh, money for many of us is not the number one motivator but it certainly is part of our dna in terms of what's important to us um, because what's really important to us and most of the people we work with is not only earning more money uh, but doing what you love and having a great quality of life, which is really the mission of CUNITY. Um, so let's start with a reality check here. Seven out of 10 Americans live paycheck to paycheck. Uh, less than one in five of U.S. adults are confident that they're saving enough for retirement. 63% of millennials are anxious about their financial situation. And six out of 10 uh, um, U.S. adults have held credit card debt in the last 12 months. Uh, so uh, some of the things I want to share with you hopefully will result in some light bulb moments uh, to make sure that your money future uh, and your profitability and the cash that comes in from your efforts in the workforce um, really pay off for you. So I hope you get some light bulb moments today as we share with you things about building a profit improvement plan, as well as a few other things that I pulled up to share with you today. So uh, again, I don't mean to hit you over the head with all these money related stats, but 30, 33% of adults rate themselves as a C, D or an F uh, on their knowledge of personal finance. And uh, so all progress starts when you tell the truth. So let's start off by going through what a profit and loss statement is, a P and L, because if we're gonna develop a profit improvement plan, that we need to work with some of the same terminology. Uh, so a profit and loss statement is simply money in minus money out for your business endeavors. And also it relates to your personal P&L too. So money in versus money out or minus money out equals net income. Now you have a business profit and loss statement, which is the money in and money out from your business uh, endeavors. And then you also have a personal p l it's not often referred to that way referred to it that way but all of us have money in and money out coming in our household now one of the first things to do is to really establish some language here and let me introduce you to a community term called preneurship well you've probably haven't heard of preneurship but certainly it looks like a word that we're familiar with which is entrepreneurship and so we want to make some definitions here because that really uh, is going to make a big difference in terms of who you are and where you're at and how you'll get the most out of our time together. There's an entrepreneur, there's a solopreneur, and then there's an entrepreneur. So an entrepreneur is some, someone that actually has what we call a business within a business. And in this particular case, um, the business is dealing with a lot of the money matters, uh, collecting the money, uh, providing the chairs and the equipment and the infrastructure, uh, marketing to get clients and booking appointments, 
uh, front desk, and then also coaching and driving revenue through something we call uh, two number growth. Then there's a solopreneur. And a solopreneur is really a business of one. Uh, and I know we have many solopreneurs joining us today. So whether you rent a, rent a suite um, or what's called a booth renter or somehow independent, uh, a solopreneur is literally someone that functions as a business of one probably files a tax return called a Schedule C, um, may get 1099 tax forms. And then there's an entrepreneur, and our definition of an entrepreneur is a business owner with a team or someone that works um, uh, in an environment where they are an, are an entrepreneur, but um, we'll leave it as business owner that has a team. So a profit and loss statement really varies depending on what type of preneur you are. So an entrepreneur has very few um, line items on their profit and loss statement. Essentially, an entrepreneur uh, gets paychecks and a lot of the money out comes directly out of their paycheck. Uh, money out for their taxes, uh, money out for other withholdings you might have out of the business. But a P&L or a profit and loss statement for an entrepreneur is pretty simple. There's not a lot, not a lot of line items on a profit and loss statement for an entrepreneur. Now, a solopreneur is gonna have more line items on a profit and loss statement. They're gonna have more money going out. Uh, rent, uh, supplies, um, um, you know, marketing, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then finally, there's an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur is gonna have many, many more line items on their profit and loss statement because they're going to have payroll, they're going to have payroll taxes, um, they could have benefits for their team, as well as a lot of the other traditional things that go out uh, money, which are supplies, um, could be laundry, um, and so on and so forth. Now, the complexity of a profit and loss statement also expands depending on what type of preneur you are. It's very simple for an entrepreneur who has a business within a business, essentially is an employee that gets a W-2. A solopreneur, it becomes more complicated. You gotta do your own record keeping. Um, you have to file quarterly estimated payments uh, and you know literally keep a profit and loss statement. And then an entrepreneur is gonna have a much more complicated uh, P&L and, and uh, they're gonna have a lot more money out as I suggested. So really, as we look at the lens of developing a profit improvement plan, it really depends on what role you're in. And I'm gonna assume that most people on this call are either solopreneurs or they're um, working either, either an, a solopreneur or an entrepreneur or someone that works within a business uh, as a leader in an entrepreneurial business. So uh, it's simple, like I said, a profit and loss statement is money in minus money out and what's left is net income. Now, we can complicate this, and I'm going to just suggest a couple other things here as it relates to profit. One of the things, if we were to, if we were to get into the weeds and dig a little bit deeper, uh, within a profit and loss statement, there's multiple measurements of profit. Uh, but usually the most important one is the one that's called net income, which is another word for net profit. Uh, some of you may also have what's called gross profit, um, which is uh, just part of the profit and loss statement, which is money in minus the cost of goods that are sold. And you might also have something called net operating profit, which is profit before expenses, for example, that are like owner's compensation and stuff like that. But for all practical purposes, net income is the measurement that we'll be looking at when we talk about a profit improvement plan. So what is a profit improvement plan? Well, it's a way to intentionally hit some type of profit target that you have for your business endeavors. So it is, first of all, if you look at the words and break them apart, we are looking at profit as the indicator here, which is the net profits of the business. Improvement means we want profit to grow. We want to improve. We want it to get better. And plan means that we're looking into the future. Um, we're forward thinking. Uh, we're creating a plan and we're determining our future by spending some time stepping back and saying, okay, this is my profit today. 
I want to improve it, and this is the plan. One of the things that we know from research, um, we've, we've, um, we have a, something called the two to 10 project uh, where we involve salons, uh, salon companies that have between two and 10 locations to come together once a year. And we've done benchmarking over the years. It's been 10 years that we've been working on this project with a variety of multi-location businesses. And we've done quite a bit of research. And one of the things that we found is that companies that plan uh, or individuals that plan um, are the ones that have the highest profitability. It sounds very intuitive, but we actually have data to prove it uh, by studying um, um, hundreds of profit and loss statements through the years. And we did is we looked at the profit, the um, uh, P&L statements for multiple businesses, and then they asked questions about certain activities in their business. And we found that businesses that planned and did, you know, they created a uh, cash flow plan and a profit plan and looked ahead, outperformed the others. So certainly planning equals profits. So a profit improvement plan, one of the things we do is we uh, break it down into something called a nine grid. And I'll give you an example, and this is going to relate um, more to a business that may have a team. So these numbers might be a little bit larger. Let's say the goal is to have a $75,000 um, $75, uh, increase in profitability over a period of time. We'll say a year. So that's our goal, $75,000. Now, a goal without a plan is just like a wish. So one of the key things with the profit improvement plan is to dive deeper and to break it down, which is what we'll do right now. And sales um, is money in. Another word for sales is revenue. And um, so let's, let's talk about sales first, which is the money in. So our profit improvement plan is gonna look at how we can both increase money in and then also manage money out, pretty intuitive. So no sales, no money. And um, without sales, then we don't have any, we don't have a business. Um, so nothing happens unless something's sold. Nothing happens without clients and clients coming in and spending money. More sales, more money. Now, one of the things that I'm gonna introduce you to, and I've got some slides from an existing program we have called Money. I'm gonna introduce you to a very simple way, and I think we have done a webinar on this subject in the past uh, with Booksy. And to simplify the money in, we like to break it down into something we call two number growth, which is essentially people and money, which by the way, for most business owners and for most people, that are um, um, even solopreneurs would keep people up at night uh, is people and money. And now two number growth is a way to really step back and look at um, money in. It's really simple. It's client count and average ticket. So how many clients that you see over a period of time, if you're a solopreneur, pretty simple. If you're an entrepreneur, um, then what it is, it's the, it's the clients that come into the business over a period of time. So client count times average ticket equals sales. It's a really simple formula. It's lost by so many different people that basically it's people times money. Now, um, you see an and in the center. You literally can multiply client count times average ticket to see what your sales are. Let's say there's 10 clients that come into a business in a day or that see a solopreneur in a day. And the average ticket is $60. Average ticket should be service and retail combined. Then sales is $600. So um, now let's break it down a little bit further. And creating structure around this really, really helps you drive results. So what we've done is we've created a dashboard. It's the two number growth dashboard. And if you look at the larger circle on the left, that's client count. Client count is driven by referrals and new business. Client count is also driven by retention, making sure that your, loyal, loyal, your clients are loyal and they come back. And rebooking or pre-booking is making sure the frequency of visit is sufficient not only to 
um, um, better service the client, but also to increase your sales as a uh, professional. So if we look at sort of the left side of the green, the left side of the screen, uh, more clients equals more money equals more sales. And that's going to come from new clients, existing clients, and the frequency of which clients see you. Then on the right side of the screen, we have average ticket. And average ticket is going to grow and sales is going to grow with product sales, add-ons, and pricing. Let's talk about pricing for a moment. One of the things to really be very aware of is that um, price increases are something that should happen at the right amount of frequency. Uh, many businesses have increased their sales over the last year. Uh, everything is going up. And those that have hesitated to increase their pricing, um, they may be doing it for good reason, but take a fresh look at it because many have very successfully increased the pricing to make sure that they're paid what they're worth. So sales, let's just say in our profit improvement plan of $75,000, we want 22,500 of that coming from higher sales. So I'm gonna break that down for you in a moment, okay? So really what this means in this example is that there's $75,000 more sales coming in, but with a, we call a 30% contribution margin after paying the costs that are directly related with those sales, then only 22,500 would really be left on the bottom line. I hope this doesn't confuse you, but my point here is that the uh, uh, of the $75,000 of additional profits, we want some of that to come from higher sales. The rest of it is going to come from lower expenses. And Tom, we've got a new question from Yolanda. Yolanda asks, so how often would you advise to raise service prices? Oh, that's a very good question. Thank you for asking that question. I would say once a year, and certainly the conditions vary, depends on what marketplace you're in, if it's a really booming town, if your books are full and you can't get anybody in, but just as a general rule of thumb, uh, I would say once a year. So hopefully answered your question. Okay, now let's spend a little bit of time looking at money out, and that's going to fill up the rest of our plan here. And in this particular case, and this, these numbers I'm sharing with you were actually based upon a real case study uh, business. And we, the numbers were rounded a little bit here. So this is an actual um, profit improvement plan that was created, and we're going to break it down for you. And then, Julie, I'll pause now and then just in case you want to throw another question out at me, okay? Absolutely. Sounds good. All right. All right. So professional supplies is the next area. And in this particular case, uh, in this business, and this is a business that had a team, it wasn't a solo, um, they found that they could better manage their professional supplies through usage, um, you know, primarily through usage uh, by $15,000. And because they were high in their professional supplies, they looked at some of the benchmarks, uh, normally professional supplies should run in the range of between six to 8%, and it could be a little bit of a wider range. Now, here's the thing with professional supplies and using a percentage. A lot of it really depends on your pricing. Let's just say hair color, your, the cost of hair color, whether you're in the heart of New York City or in Wichita, Kansas, or in Ankeny, Iowa, the price is gonna be the same. Uh, the cost is gonna be the same, but the pricing is gonna be higher. So we need to look at the percentages with a little bit of grain of salt. So when I give you that number between six to eight percent, it also depends on how much is color. Um, also, we have um, spa practitioners on um, uh, on this webinar here. So it really depends. But in this particular case, the business found that through better usage, less waste um, and better purchasing, that they could save fifteen thousand dollars a year in professional supply costs. Next, there's labor. And uh, in this particular case, uh, with this business, uh, they found that they were spending, uh, they weren't taking advantage of great technology, uh, such as like Booksy, and a lot of their frontline expenses were higher than they needed to be. 
And so they felt that they could uh, better manage their labor costs, um, especially frontline labor costs, to the tune of $16,500. And that was going to come through uh, when people had, um, um, when there was normal turnover for certain positions, they didn't replace certain people at the front desk. So this wasn't a matter of layoffs or anything like that. They just, you know, better managed uh, front desk labor. One thing that I'll throw in here from the perspective, as you mentioned, Tom, of technology, um, when it comes to managing your booking, a good thing to remember is to make sure that you're taking advantage of the technology that you have. So for instance, if you're using Booky, Booksy, goodness, can't even talk today. If you're using Booksy, you want to make sure that you have turned on, for instance, the waitlist feature so that if you have a cancellation, then you can have any client be notified that's in the area. Clients can get on that waitlist and be like, look, I really desperately need something before the 16th. So if it's available, they will automatically get that notification and your books are then taken care of and your labor can be more balanced without you having to do that extra bit of work to it or without you having to have that risk. And we also have things like cancellation fees and those can really help protect these costs here so that you are not at the mercy of um, people's uh, forgetfulness or distractions or busyness. Julie, you chime in whenever you want. That is a great <laughs> share. Thank you so much. And you know, Julia, I, I, I've had this perpetual frustration through the years uh, when it comes to technology. And the frustration is not with the technology, it's the use of technology. Uh, I, I remember going through a period as, as a salon leader and we were looking at you know changing what system we used. And, um, and what I found is we were using very, very little of what we already had, you know? So one of the things that I believe is a big waste is um, when you have a system like Booksy is to just take advantage of as many of the resources as you can. So we sign up for something and then we just, you know, we, 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 we run into our normal. We never step back and say, wow, there's all these features that I'm not using. So staying with labor a little bit longer, um, if it's a business, if, if it's a salon and spa business with a team, I'm also going to give you a range of what might be spent for frontline labor. Uh, it could be, you know, 8%, uh, 6 to 8% is pretty typical as far as a, um, a benchmark range uh, for frontline payroll, and that's relative to total sales. Again, that can vary, and it varies quite a bit. I've seen businesses that spend like 12% and 14% and ones that spend way less. I think the important thing is to find the sweet spot that really meets the needs of your business and your expectations for customer service. So this is something, um, this is a cost area, um, service payroll, support payroll, that varies quite a bit by business. And in this particular case, um, and in this case study, they found that there was an opportunity to be more efficient with hours, using technology, et cetera. Marketing. So uh, marketing varies quite a bit. This is, a, this is an area that we refer to as being a discretionary item on a profit and loss statement. And again, in this particular business, now I realize that there's many solopreneurs on here, so use the math. The math could be very different in your particular case. But what this company found is that they were spending um, quite a bit of excess funds on outside marketing services and hadn't really become um, ha hadn't really taken advantage of a lot of the marketing that's at their fingertips through social media, et cetera. And so that they found that their spending for marketing um, was a bit excessive and they brought some of it in-house to the tune of saving almost $10,000. Technology. Um, in this particular case, uh, they had an outside firm, um, outside uh, IT firm, that they had extra services that they really didn't need. Um, so they reviewed their contract. They still kept with this firm because they did need, you know, they didn't have a lot of moving parts with their technology and they did need expertise, but they didn't need quite as robust of expertise as needed so they could save $4,300 there. Meetings. So, you know, um, uh, team meetings are great. Um, I believe meetings are very important. Meetings sometimes has a negative, um, uh, um, a negative connotation to them. 
But um, meetings to me um, with the team are very important from an information standpoint, from a celebration standpoint. I love having information celebrations. And, but what they did is they looked at the meeting schedules they had through the year and they were spending an excessive amount for renting uh, meeting space. And some of their food costs were a little bit ridiculous. Uh, so they decided that they could save a little bit of money in their meetings without compromising these great get togethers that are needed for a team to stay connected and engaged. Amenities. Uh, amenities are things that are available to the guest um, in the terms of you know, um, coffee, uh, parking, uh, flowers, just different things. You know, flowers seems a little weird to be an amenity. I mean, but it's because it's not like you give flowers away, but work with me on that. Okay. But the point is that they found that there was um, a lot of beverages uh, that they were providing their guests that their guests really didn't appreciate or need and they didn't miss them when they removed them. So many people have looked at their profit and loss statements during the pandemic, Julia, and they really have looked at a new P&L. And they found that there are things that they could do without that the guests didn't miss. I mean, the guests just really wanted great service. They didn't really need a lot of these extras that felt a little bit like fluff. So certainly amenities in this particular case was a great save. Uh, and then miscellaneous, there was miscellaneous, I don't even remember what they were, but there was just a handful of things. I mean, if you look at a profit and loss statement for an entrepreneur, for a business, I mean, there could be 40, 50 line items and just little chunks on the P&L, just little savings here and there added up. And there was another $4,500 that uh, resulted from that. Oh, here it is. I forgot. I had this office supplies. Um, paying early on certain bills and taking advantage of one-time payments. So for example, let's say that you have a payment for uh, property and casualty insurance and you can elect to pay monthly or you can pay all at once a year in advance and save money. That's what we mean by certain things as it related to early pay. So there you go. So there is a profit improvement plan. And this, what you're seeing on the screen here is a Cunity 9 grid. It's a mind map. Uh, mind map means the central theme, the idea, opportunity, whatever we want to call it, is in this is in the center box there. And then the outer boxes we broke down. We started out with sales. Remember, nothing happens without a sale. Uh, and there we looked at twenty two hundred five hundred twenty two thousand five hundred dollars as what would come out of it after paying expenses uh, related directly to sales. Then we looked at professional supplies. Um, um, uh, then we looked at professional size supplies being hair color, uh, being uh, things at the uh, shampoo bowls, uh, labor, primarily frontline labor, uh, outside marketing costs, technology, meetings, amenities, and then miscellaneous. So now one of the things, if you're not familiar with the QD9 grid, I know we've had nine grids um, that we've done webinars with you on in the past. Uh, you can go to the CUNITY website, cunityinc.com. I'll share with you at the end. You can see what a nine grid is, but essentially what a nine grid is, is a, um, uh, in this particular case, is a mind map. So you literally could sit down and just mind map your way into a profit improvement plan and not overthink it. Um, certainly attaching numbers to this requires a little research, but you literally at the end of this webinar can sit down and just draw one of these out, put in the center profit improvement plan. And this is how much more in profits I want to have. Um, uh, in my particular case, or in the case we just shared with you, it's over a year, but you can also do a profit improvement plan that could be for a month. So you can take a shorter slice of time and do that. And then just start to jot out because you may know where you already have some excess, uh, where you also may have an opportunity for increased sales. Um, the sales example I shared, that's $75,000 of additional sales that resulted in twenty two five after paying credit card fees, paying staff labor, um, et cetera, et cetera, or professional supplies um, could have come just from a price increase. Could be that simple. So a profit improvement plan does not have to be complicated. Um, it could be super simple. Uh, it could be for a monthly period of time. It could be for a quarter. It could be for a year. Uh, your numbers could be larger than this. They could be smaller than that. 
Remember though, that planning pays and um, uh, when you plan, you become more profitable. All right, now, uh, I've got some uh, I've got some other things to share with you, and that's me right there in a awkward pose staring into a camera. And uh, I really felt that looking at a profit improvement plan and looking at your money matters, I want to share with you some things that relate to taxes, because even though technically uh, many of you that are on this webinar, if you're part of a business that's organized as either uh, organized as what's called the tax pass-through company. A pass-through company means that the company doesn't actually pay taxes. The profit from the company passes through to the shareholder. For example, what's something called an S corporation. Then um, for us to really look at a profit improvement plan, we also should look at taxes. Even though for many of you, taxes don't show up on your profit and loss statement, but it certainly makes a big, big difference in terms of your cash flow. So I'm going to share with you some tax truths and also some other things that will affect your ultimate profitability um, when you look at not just the profit and loss statement from your business, but your profit and loss statement as it looks at, uh, um, as it relates to your household. Now, uh, I didn't really share any about any of my background, but uh, I was a uh, I was a CPA, a certified public accountant for the first 13 years of my career. I spent about 26,000 hours as a, um, a CPA in practice, uh, and much of that was uh, related with tax matters. Uh, so first, thir first 13 years of my career working with creative uh, entrepreneurial companies um, as a tax advisor, uh, also, as a person that helped businesses really address financial matters in a variety of uh, different methods. And then it was, um, uh, then for the last, I don't even know how many years, Julie, it's been a very, very long time. Uh, I focused primarily on the salon and spa uh, and professional beauty industry. And so anyway, I spent a lot of time doing tax returns, uh, helping people with tax matters. But just in the interest of full disclosure and just to make sure that I don't um, that I represent myself correctly, I am no longer a CPA. I no longer have a tax practice. Uh, I'm sharing this in the form of education. Please, this shouldn't be a substitute for getting great tax advice on your own. And that's probably recommend recommendation number one is to make sure that you have good tax advice, because sometimes um, sometimes tax alone um, can be an equivalent of $75,000 in the in the example I shared with you here. So let me give you some tax truths. And um, so, all right. So first of all, tax matters. Literally, it matters. Um, the average American um, spends 525, this is the average, spends $525,000 in their lifetime on taxes. So taxes bite, they literally bite. They take a big bite out of our paycheck and they take a big bite out of our profit because once, let's say we, let's say that we had an additional $75,000 of profit, then that goes, to, then we gotta pay taxes on that. So out of $75,000 of incremental profit because of your profit improvement plan, you might only keep 50,000 of that. So taxes, taxes do indeed bite, and that's why it's important when we look at a profit improvement plan, a plan to look at taxes. Now, taxes are also the price we pay. Uh, it's the price we pay for certain things, whether we like it or not. Um, things that we pay for are parks, uh, recreation, um, um, uh, schools, um, 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 protection, etc. So it is the price we pay in society. And we can go all over the place in terms of what we agree with or disagree with, which, with how our money is spent. But the reality is that some form of taxes are necessary in a civilized society. Um, now, there are different types of taxes. Uh, there are income taxes. And most of what we pay uh, out of our lifetime of $525,000 of taxes are income taxes, taxes that we pay on the income that comes into our business. There's also payroll taxes. 
And payroll taxes, really, it's very important to distinguish whether we're an entrepreneur or a solopreneur. An entrepreneur or someone that works with, within a business and gets a W-2, the company pays half of the payroll taxes. And you pay half the payroll taxes if you're an entrepreneur and an employee that gets a W-2. A solopreneur pays their all of their own payroll taxes. And when I say payroll taxes, I mean FICA, um, Social Security, and Medicare taxes. And like it or not, um, all of us pay payroll taxes. The other form of taxes besides income and payroll taxes are sales tax, property tax, consumption tax, investment tax, and that's a deeper dive, but the vast majority of taxes that most of us pay are income and payroll taxes. Now, also tax truths are we are we are on what's what's called a pay as you go system. So if you're working as an employee in a company or an entrepreneur, you pay as you go because the company would withhold your income taxes um, with each paycheck based upon a selection that you make for how many exemptions. If you're a solopreneur, it's up to you to pay as you go. And this is a trap for many. They don't realize that or they get behind, but solopreneurs need to make quarterly tax payments um, for the estimated amount of their taxes that they will pay during a calendar year. Also an entrepreneur typically makes quarterly estimated uh, tax payments also. So we are on what's called a pay-as-you-go system. Now, um, the other things that relate with tax truths, where you live matters. Uh, I happen to live in the great state of Minnesota. And uh, I was just spending time with a friend of mine yesterday who is, um, uh, who is actually retired. And he is moving from Minnesota to Florida because Florida has no income tax. So Minnesota is a high tax state, New York's a high tax state, and several states, you know, are lower tax states. Now, I have to be a little careful here because ultimately a state has to raise revenue. And there may be no income tax, but they might have very high property taxes. But the point here is where you live makes a really big difference in terms of what you pay in taxes. We all pay federal taxes, and how much we pay in tax, uh, state taxes really depends on where we live. Um, other things that um, relate with tax truths is that taxes change often and they're complicated. They change often and they're complicated. And we're in the midst of some massive changes to the tax code as we speak. So this is a reason why it's very important to get great tax advice. Um, um, I'll even take the word, take out the word great and say it's important to get tax advice. And many things that we do in life, um, taxes do matter. For example, buying a house, um, investing in something, starting in a business, having children, um, supporting loved ones in other ways. Um, many, many areas of our life, taxes impact that. So I think it's really important when we're talking about a profit improvement plan and um, is, is to really make sure that we understand that getting good advice is really important. Now, I'm gonna throw something in here. This is a quote, Julia, that I like to say, um, uh, sales is vanity, um, profit is sanity, and cash is king. So uh, profit is sale, I mean, profit is sanity, and making sure that you have a profitable business is huge but also make sure you understand the difference between profit and cash flow. And the difference between profit and cash flow, I used a good example is you might have a profit, you might have a $75,000 increase in profit, but you might only have a $50,000 increase in cash flow because 25,000 of that 75,000 went to higher taxes from your profit improvement plan. Uh, all right, let me see what else I have for you as it relates to uh, um, uh, taxes. As it relates to getting good advice, uh, there's different types of professionals that can help you. There's a CPA, which stands for a Licensed Certified Public Accountant. 
Uh, and usually they've had more rigorous training and have a higher degree of standards in order for them to be licensed. Then there's something called an enrolled agent uh, that also is a tax professional that is there to help you, but may not have the uh, CPA designation. So an enrolled agent, there's a lot of great enrolled agents. Um, so that could be a great way for you to have um, uh, great tax advice. All right, now. And then just as you're at this point, um, we just we put in the chat just a little bit ago uh, while you were taking us through this, um, who here gets tax advice for your business income? And uh, you, I had seen Mel typing, but uh, Yolanda says, I personally have a mentor who advises me in finances. That's something that we hear a lot in these industries. And Mel says, ah, Mel says, is this uh, available for later playback viewing? Yes, Mel, we understand that you're working and that you're doing things simultaneously. This will be available on YouTube. I'll give you that information at the end, but you can go to the Booksy Biz YouTube page and you will be able to find this. But back to Yolanda, who says, um, having a mentor. And Tom, can you just touch on really the importance of that? Because so many of us do get our advice just from the people in the industry around us. You know, I, I, ha I have something on my desk here uh, and it's, it's, it says ask and ask for help. And I think, I think having a mentor is an amazing thing. Keep in mind though, that your mentor may not really be qualified to advise in tax matters because I'll go back to something else I said earlier. Taxes are complicated and they change often. So your mentor may be a great mentor as it relates to general financial matters and I'm all in, I'm all for it, amen, go for it. But make sure that you don't expect your mentor to advise you in matters that require a different degree of qualification. Um, you know the the area if we look at if we look at law for example it's full of specialties you're not going to go to a um, a corporate lawyer for a family related legal matter um, you're not going to go to a real estate uh, lawyer for a human resource issue it's the same thing with mentors and advisors um, please leave room for specialization because um, the difference between somebody that really understands tax and someone that just has a general understanding is massive. Um, it is amazing how much people waste in taxes. So um, yes on the mentor, but make sure that you have specialization when it comes to tax matters and other, other financial matters. So Perfect. Thank you so much. Just wanted to make sure that we got that um, responded to. So that's great. All right, let me see what else I got. I've got, um, uh, uh, I, okay. I love this quote. No one's not enough, we must apply, and being willing is not enough, we must do. And I've got some other nuggets I'm gonna throw in here, okay, that really relate with a profit improvement plan and relate with just some general, um, general thoughts that I have for people on money matters. Relation, talking about money, and um, money and relationships is something that doesn't really get discussed very much. And that's why in a new course we created, a money course, we have a whole module that's just talking about money and, you know, timing, um, how to approach a money, do's and don'ts, um, how much to share, how little to share. And uh, money and relation, money matters can make or break relationships. And I'm sure all of us have examples of that. So, and one of the things, and this is just a little pet peeve of mine, is to, um, is to distinguish between um, being frugal and cheap. Uh, to me, um, cheap is the person that has those alligator arms at the, uh, at the restaurant when we're sharing the bill and they're just a little bit slow to reach in and, you know, drop their money in and, and, <laughs> You know, so I, I think we all know people that are cheap and sometimes cheap, cheap has a negative connotation, at least to me personally. It means that we're not willing to pay our fair share. Uh, and uh, frugal to me is something I, I think frugalness is great. Uh, frugalness is that we value our money. We pay attention to it. Some of the most generous people I know are also very frugal. They watch their money watching your money is a really good thing. I mean, it is a currency and it's a currency that affects ourselves and our loved ones. So uh, please, uh, please um, find your own definition of whether you're being frugal or cheap. So that's one thing right there. 
another one. Uh, and this is a money matter tip that I'm going to share with you. It's something we teach in some of our courses. And that's something called a Tuesday transfer. And a Tuesday transfer um, is every week, uh, take a certain percentage of the previous week's sales and set it aside in a separate bank account that is used to do something very specifically. So some people will do a Tuesday transfer into multiple separate funds a Tuesday transfer for their taxes. So taxes don't sneak up on them. And every single week they're dropping a little bit in a separate tax account. And then maybe have a separate account uh, that's a Tuesday transfer into a savings fund that you wanna use for a trip, uh, to buy a house, uh, to you know um, retire debt, whatever. So certainly a Tuesday transfer. And by the way, it doesn't have to be on Tuesday, but I think that weekly ritual of just setting money aside will allow you to gain greater control. Um, here's 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 uh, something else for you as it look as it relates to money matters, and we de develop a profit improvement plan. When you look at spending, and many of us don't have an earnings issue, we have a spending issue. We have a lot of money in, but we just don't have great discipline as it relates to uh, money out. And we don't like budgeting. We think budgeting sucks and all of that. So let's look at money out. And I'm going to give you a few things to be thinking out, thinking about. When it relates to money out in a business, uh, generally there's, there's different types of costs. Uh, there's fixed, variable, and periodic. A fixed cost is the same every month, rent. Variable varies based upon sales, merchant fees. Um, if you are in a commission-based salon, uh, the amount that gets paid to staff for service revenue. Um, so variable expenses and usually, usually professional supplies also is a variable expense. It's gonna vary in direct relationship to sales. If sales are higher, that expense is gonna be higher. If sales is lower, it's gonna be lower. And then the final category is called periodic and periodic is occasional. Um, so a periodic uh, cost, for example, would be your quarterly tax state, uh, a quarterly tax payment. So it's not, it's not variable, it's not fixed. Well, it is kind of variable also because that periodic expense is gonna, your, your, your taxes that you're setting aside are gonna be based upon some, um, um, some variable cost. Anyway, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna start confusing everybody here, but fixed, variable, and periodic. And so really breaking down those costs, I think is an important thing to be thinking about. The other, the other thing that I wanted to mention is um, spending categories. And I'm gonna bring this down more to our household. And one of the things that we've developed, and we have a separate nine grid on this, is eight different spending categories that most of us have. And I'll break it down for you. And there's certain benchmarks for each housing, food, transportation. You know, all of us have those. We have a housing cost, whether it's mortgage or rent. We have food costs and we have transportation costs. Then there's utilities, insurance, health related matters, whether it's health insurance or out of pocket um, uh, health costs. So those are those are six right there, housing, food, transportation, utilities, insurance, um, and health. Then we have two other categories. The next one is lifestyle, and that includes a bunch of different things. Uh, pets, uh, if you have a family, family-related expenses, because you know it really depends on if you have a family, what kind of family you have. But lifestyle expenses would be, uh, or um, spends would be the seventh category. And then the eighth would be this big area that we call other, that are many of the areas that we already discussed are some big things such as tax, debt payments, savings, um, giving back. And so those are a few things. So really, if, if, if you have a money out issue um, in your household, it's really great to break it down into those eight spending categories and to really prioritize amongst them. Uh, so, that is what I have 
uh, I'm looking at some of my notes here. I want to see if there's anything else I want to. I, I love doing this stuff, by the way, Julie. I'm so glad I got to do this. I'm trying to see. Uh, you know, the other thing I want to say is just asking for help is huge. Um, asking for help and getting education is massive. And um, uh, by showing up today, you're getting education. And by showing up today, it's also a way that you're really asking for help, uh, understanding that um, that none of us can know everything. I've got some favorite quotes here. And uh, I've got a quote that's from Will Rogers, and I'm going to give you his quote and my adaptation of it. The quote is that everybody's ignorant only on different subjects. My adaptation of that is everybody's intelligent only in different subjects. And so uh, it's so important to surround ourselves with people that complete ourselves. So asking for help is huge and getting education. And I love that Booksy offers these webinars. It's great. We love being part of these. And um, um, so anyway, I hope you got some light bulb moments today. Maybe a few things connected together. Um, you're, uh, I do host a weekly financial roundtable. You can use this QR code. Um, and uh, there it'll help you uh, go to the place you can sign up. It's every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Central Time. Register. There's no charge to it. Uh, I started doing this. Uh, I started doing these um, roundtables, which is a Zoom meeting um, towards the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, Julia, uh, we, I was only going to do it for like five, five weeks, and now we're on like week 61. So certainly join us. There's no charge to it. Uh, follow us on Instagram uh, at Cunity Inc. Uh, and, um, and if you follow us there, you'll be entered to win a nine grid notebook. And that or those are my final remarks. So thank you for showing up today. And, and I'm um, going to chime in to just let you know a few things. Let me get you pinned again. There we go. So now everyone can see your smiling face. So just so you know, um, from our chat, Cynthia has said, I really appreciate this. Yolanda says, yes, thank you so much for your wisdom. Mel agrees that she absolutely goes to someone for help on business taxes. So lots of agreement here, lots of appreciation here. And just to let everyone else know, you can continue. I've dropped this in the chat as well. You can continue your financial education with CUNITY and Booksy. Um, our next opportunity is a free webinar again on December 6th. It is for the three C's of financial management, which are closure, clarity, and confidence. You can find the link right there in the chat. You will also be able to find it on our Instagram page if you go to that link in our bio. And then I've also dropped in the links to follow Booksy and CUNITY on Instagram. And as part of Booksy's commitment to continuing education, as Tom said, I'm going to drop one more set of links in the chat for you now. Don't worry. All of these will be showing up on Instagram as well. You don't have to capture them here, but if you want to, we are focusing on a series of educational events with some of the masters of their crafts. So coming up on November 1st, which is next Monday, again at 2 p.m., all of these are at 2 p.m. Central Time. We will have a mastering massage class with Raymond Eden of Relax Miami. On the 18th, we will have a nail art class with Spifster Sutton, who is just one of my nail art heroes. Um, on no uh, goodness, um, we will have mastering lashes with uh, Naomi De Luna of Beauty Hood Chicago. It looks like I've typed the wrong date there, so I will enter that correctly in just a moment. And on December 13, we are going to have mastering four ways to balayage with Alfredo Lewis. So for everyone here that is in the hair world, which I'm expecting is a lot of you, if you don't know Alfredo Lewis, you should follow him. He's astounding. All of these educators are. They're really brilliant. And they are all providing their education for you because of their commitment, just like Tom has today, because of the commitment to really building our knowledge and building our growth of our community as a whole. So please, please take advantage of this. Tell everyone you'll be able to find all of these on our Instagram page. Now I'll hand it back over to Tom to sign us off. But thank you from all of us here. Thank you for being here because without you, there wouldn't be any point in what we do. Yeah, I, I have a, a deep love and affection for the professional beauty industry and, uh, and, and not just the professional beauty industry, but the other participants that would, that would use a, a service such as Booksy. And it uh, gives me juice to be on something like this. Julia, uh, thanks for being a great host today. And uh, I hope that uh, I'll be on another one of these someday.
Well, we are happy to have you here anytime. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and we look forward to seeing you soon. And this webinar will be up on YouTube. If not today, then by tomorrow. So if you need to review any of those tips, you'll be able to see them there. Thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your Monday. Thank you.